Hey there, Intrepid Coders! We're picking up with this next video in the Minigame Project series where I goof off with jQuery in 2024. Now, in the very first video, I cover a lot of the prerequisites, not prerequisites, but concepts behind this uh, project build and why I chose just HTML, CSS, and jQuery. It's used in like almost 80 million websites. It's still around despite its age. It's still straightforward, has some decent quality of life. You still learn a lot about the fundamentals of DOM. You gain a new appreciation for your React, Vue, Angular projects. And it's been a while since I built something super simple, which is why I chose to do it this way. The README has more of that, the first video on this playlist, which you can find in the link down below or in this, uh, I have the playlist listed here in the uh, video titles and how to find them as well. So you could use the README as kind of like your single source of truth. But check the description down below for a link to the repository. You can always grab the latest commit to just follow along with me. Or I do recommend you follow along with the other videos as well if you're stumbling on this one because I do better uh, tag organization and SEO and y'all stumble upon it in the middle of the series. I do suggest you watch the whole thing, but you are welcome to pick up from the last commit of the video before this, which I think is 05, and just picking up from there and following along with me. Again, rather than copying and pasting everything from this repository, I do recommend you just write along. Even if you don't know what's going on, you will learn something as long as you start typing. All right. So instead of wasting a whole bunch of time on my intro like I tend to sometimes, description down below, links, blah, blah, blah. Let's just get going because I don't want to waste a lot of time. We got a lot to do this video. So we had left off pretty much finishing the memory game and building out our shell of our website around this. Uh, I don't have it currently running right now or open in the browser because I ran into a little issue in the last video with how these links work. And I wanted to do a little bit more research to make sure I can tell you all how they work because when I test stuff, off camera or prepare, like I don't write a script, but I do make bullet points of where I wanna go to make sure I keep myself at least somewhat on the rails and in a general direction. I tend to use an extension when I build these things out rather than just loading them directly in the browser, which and that extension, as you probably saw from my tabs listed up here, is called Live Server. Uh, it is an extension you can find in your extensions list in VS Code. Matter of fact, I don't know why I opened it in the browser. It's kinda of stupid considering I can find it right down here. Uh, go search the live server extension by Ritwick Day or find any live server extension that you happen to like. It is a very convenient tool for running uh, and opening static files and, uh, and things like that in the browser with auto refresh. And what I mean by that is, let's check it out. If I open or select my index HTML in the root of my project, I open it with our live server. And wouldn't you know it, it opened the page no problem uh, directly in the browser for me. And instead of my hard drive path being C, covalence, helping students, mini game project, it is simply a local host and port it auto assigns and opens that index HTML for this project. So basically it's building like the simplest Node Express server. For those of you that have seen my uh, previous videos and other things on this channel, you know, we use Node Express a lot, but it's actually really simple. Now, this is just pseudocode. So if you're getting ready to follow along, do not. Do not write just example. Right, so it would do something like this where you would have a const require. You bring in express. You would then make an express server you would then have your app use the express static middleware and you would simply say in the root of the project, like load the index HTML or something like that. You would probably, you should write like a path join or something like that, but you can get away with just saying in the root of the project, write an index HTML, it'll look for it automatically. Uh, and then you would just say app listen and what port did they use just so I can point it out, 5,500. So you do something like that. That's as simple as it need to be uh, and that's, kind of what's happening behind the scenes, but not really. But obviously there's more to it because it will auto refresh the browser whenever it detects any kind of CSS, JS, or uh, HTML change. So it has clearly a lot more quality of life on it, but at least now the links will work more like they would in the real world when you actually would have a server that would be building out these, or sending us to these pages here. So, you know, the, the fiasco I ran into was forgetting exactly about root relative URLs, 
relative URLs, absolute URLs, and base URLs, as well as what's considered a decent practice. So as of right now, these actually default to what's called relative URLs, and they are relative to the current location of the HTML file. If I provide a forward slash to these, they are now what are called root relative URLs. And this is something that you would see if you remember in JavaScript, anyone that's written these before, like their own full stack projects, if you do something like that, and my students do this all the time, where if they forget their leading forward slash, it adds on to the ending of the current path, whereas this is relative to the root URL, meaning if it's localhost colon 5500, it'll be fetching to localhost colon 5500 slash API slash blog. And that's what you want it to do. So uh, in the case of my file path, the relative, the root URL was my C drive, which is why uh, I could be on a location like this. It might be covalence helping students slash uh, mini game project slash index.html. And if we click on a link, it would consider the root URL, like about HTML. It would consider the for in the link click, for example, was about HTML like just right up there in that anchor, what it would do then is it would resolve the root of the website, which would, it, the way I guess a uh, file system works with VS, I mean, file system works is that it resolves it to C drive. That's why it tries to navigate to C drive about HTML and why it would fail when we included that forward slash there. Uh, absolute URLs would be, well, basically writing this, which would be, oh, to get to our main page, you would write that entire root path, which as we can see is going to lead to problems once we get this thing deployed beyond our computers. Uh, you can provide something called a base where you can write the following, I believe, in the, uh, in the, somewhere in our document, probably the head of the HTML, where you would write like a uh, root URL of some kind or base rather like that, and then from there, your links would use that as the base instead, right? So there's a couple of ways to do it here, and again, remember the leading forward slash being there is called a relative, a root relative URL, and we probably want path relative. So to be consistent, I'm gonna go ahead and write my path relative links in, the nav in my nav bars like this, that way I can guarantee they'll work both in my file system way, if you're gonna follow along with that, or I mean, rather, if you're gonna to stick to that, or if you wanna to go to the more server appropriate way with this live server extension to mimic more exactly what's gonna happen in the real world when we deploy this project so people can actually check it out in our portfolios, then this will be a more consistent way to do so. So I'm gonna to head to my about HTML and correct the links there as well. So we're gonna to go to each HTML file we currently have and simply correct those paths. So you can see that's where I began talking about it in the previous video and I clearly forgot to do it for the one down yonder, which I think is kind of funny. Uh, there we go. Let's confirm they all work. So these still navigate them on their own, no problem on the home page and the about page clearly. If I go to my memory match game, the about link correctly works as it'd be broken before. The games links currently work and we're good to go. So yeah, that's uh, what I wanted to talk about as a note on anchor tags while we were uh, here and discussing about it as I moved on to this video. So again, something to learn something new for everything and for everyone. Uh, another thing I want to do is an adjustment in my HTML file here where I would love to have the name of the name of the game in the title just to give it a bit more dynamic feel to it. That way, you know, the the if someone has like 50 tabs open in their browser, they can also have a better idea of what they're looking at from that title right there. It's more dynamic, right? So we'll do the same thing for today's game, which will be Tic-Tac-Toe. Uh, and again, that's something you tend to do with like the React Helmet library. If you're familiar with any kind of React building, you typically use Helmet to adjust the title of the page, or you can use a simple use effect that when the page renders, you reference the document title DOM property and change it, for example. But yeah, uh, there's different ways to do it, but here in vanilla HTML, we just gotta remember to write it ourselves and something I remembered uh, in, between, in between videos. So yeah, that's the way we're gonna rock that sucker right there. So, okay, what we're gonna do today is, like I said, build out uh, tic-tac-toe, which is why I didn't want to dilly-dally too, too much on the intro, why I kept it short and jumped right into the note on anchors to make it a teaching moment. Now we're gonna continue our learning by 
coding out a uh, tic-tac-toe, right? So this is what? This is the index HTML for memory games. We're gonna close that out. We're gonna come back there in just a moment, but my regular root index HTML. We're gonna head down to where the game cards are that we had from the previous video where I made the website actually feel a bit more realistic. I'm gonna destroy all the game cards except for one because I don't need them. I just need to copy and paste at least one. So we're gonna go ahead and grab that right there. What I'm gonna do is copy my game card for memory match. And now all I need to do is adjust it for, you guessed it, tic-tac-toe. And like I said, at some point here, we'll actually switch from using these dumb placeholder backgrounds to real. Uh, play the game of tic-tac-toe. If someone doesn't know what that is, then they have issues. Yeah, that's a terrible, it's a, such a boring description, but it is what it is. So remember down here on the, oh, more anchors I got to worry about here. So same thing for like for the memory match game. So I scrolled slightly up. I will say this directory games slash me slash memory match and we're going to specify the index html right there there we go i'll do the same thing down here i'll do dot slash games and then i don't have it yet but tick tack toe slash index html will be the uh href for this anchor down here and we're going to go ahead and build that out uh, now, I didn't say play the classic in a tic-tac-toe because I intend to make it a bit more goofy or advanced or have some options for it. Uh, we're going to code the simplest one out first, and then we're going to add the future features later. So let's go ahead in our games folder, in our the way we decided to start scaling out this project. We're going to make our index.html. I'll do a quick exclamation point enter, h1 ttt for tic-tac-toe, just so I know I'm there. I'm going to go ahead and write a style.css. Body, we'll do color red just to quickly make sure I have it all linked together correctly. And our game.js for the game logic with a nice console log message found within. So in our index HTML, I'll go ahead and make sure my game.js is linked. And then up yonder, I'll go ahead and make sure that my style CSS is linked and my general CSS is linked, which if you recall is up one, up one more into CSS, main.css as that file, there we go. So we should have some indication if this is working or not. In terms of specificity, our lower style sheet should override whatever the main CSS has for these text on the screen. So if I head back over to minigame project, if you notice, Every time I save my file, Live Server will auto refresh it here, which is why everything just automatically refreshed and uh, did what it needed to do. So the fact I see that uh, off white background color means my main CSS is linked. Uh, I also have my lovely red text there. I got my console linked and ready to go. So we are set up and prepared to get this sucker working. So what we're gonna do from our other HTML file, I'm gonna need to make sure I grab jQuery as well as I currently don't have it. I'm gonna make sure, oops, I'm gonna make sure that's copied and pasted into our tic-tac-toe game. I'm also looking at the wrong index HTML. Let's, let's open the one for memory match. There we go. So in memory match, let's go ahead and grab our nav bar because I wanna make sure that is put into place. We're gonna paste that all these wrong ones are open, y'all. Let me get rid of the ones I don't need. Go away. I want two index HTMLs open, my God. One for tic-tac-toe and one for memory match. Is that so much to ask? There we go. So there's memory match. We're copying and pasting from it to make our lives easy at the moment. Pasting it into the body. Below that, I'll have a main container where I'll put my H1 tic-tac-toe back into to make sure it's contained correctly. Uh, let's make sure the nav bar is loading up. It sure is. Tic-tac-toe is now in the container and we are ready to start building this sucker out beyond what we got going on. So uh, while we're here, let's go ahead and go to memory match and also grab that title so we can modify it for our purposes over here. Paste and that way they're consistent. And yeah, we'll call it tic-tac-toe in the title. And I think we are now ready to go. There really isn't much else I got to copy and paste between these two. So we're going to close memory match now that it's set up and ready to go. And let's build this sucker out. Now, I know for my alumni that are watching this video series of uh, this, they're like, oh, bro, tic-tac-toe again. I get it. We'll, we'll do we'll do a uh, different way that you probably have solved it before. And it's one of those things where, like, if you are 
watching this and you join like our boot camp or whatever and I see you solve it this way and I know you have no coding background, I'll raise an eyebrow and ask you to solve it differently if we did like a live review or something like that. Or if you do use this solution, just make sure you can explain it to somebody if they ask even at a rudimentary level because you're gonna be doing yourself a disservice by just copying and pasting this into our tic-tac-toe lab in the course and going for it. But if you feel like you already have know how to do this, just go ahead and code out your own version and get, get it working and then just modify what you wanna modify or you know, pull in the techniques that I use that you might like better, for example. That's, that's all, what coding is all about, right? There's no individual, there's typically not a single way to solve anything. There's typically a lot of different solutions you could do, some better than others. But uh, let's get going here. So we need to make uh, two things. Like I want one div that will be the game board and I'll have that class selector right there to get the game board going. And then I want a div below that that will signify the game info, like our info panel, just like in the memory match game that has like the reset and the slider difficulty. We'll have some information down here to display. The game board will actually be the rows or the three rows, which means we can go ahead and code those in. So I can do div class row times three and I get three rows generated. There is actually more that we could do. For example, if I go back to div.row times three, child selector div.cell times three. So that's the snippet, div.row times three, child selector, div.cell times three. And if I hit enter, I now basically get my entire tic-tac-toe board scaffolded out in one uh, Emmet snippet. Again, I talk about this where you're not going to make an entire website out of Emmet uh, shortcuts, but you can have some fun uh, generating a bunch of scaffolding very quickly. So... Uh, right away, this is going to be a little bit different from what y'all are used to if you are an alumni of our course in that I'll be doing something kind of cool on these. We're going to be using data attributes that will signify what column these all are or what row they all are in the case of X and then the column in terms of Y. So obviously... Uh, they're all going to just start with zeros here, and I'll change them as we go. So the X's are rows. So row zero is the top row, signified by these three. This will be the middle row. So what we're going to do is highlight by using Alt or Command on Mac. Click and changing the zeros to ones, like a fancy find and replace. And then these down here, you guessed it, will be twos. So zero, ones, and twos. These will be a little bit more complex in the sense that they will be zero, one, two, zero, one, two, because remember, these specify the columns rather than the row. So that's the way they're going to be organized right there. So yeah, that is our tic-tac-toe game board along with the three sets of the game board, the rows, and the cells. And this should give me plenty of divs to control via flex or grid or something like that to display this nicely on this page. But because these have no content at the moment and they are all divs, they're going to be stacked all vertically inside of there. So for now, I'll add an X in the left corner and an O in the direct center. So when I begin to style it, I can see what this looks like. And as you can see, it don't look too hot at the moment. And I don't really care, that's fine. All right, so uh, beneath that, we're gonna go ahead and code out our info panel as well while we are here. And then I'll style it all up in the style sheet and probably blast through the JavaScript so this video doesn't last a full hour like my previous attempt uh, ran before life happened and I didn't feel like editing it because I didn't like the take, so I redid the whole thing because I'm a crazy person. Okay, so what we're gonna do inside of the game info is we're gonna have a div that will signify who our current player is. I'm gonna control that with a div wrapping around a, say, paragraph or another div, it doesn't really matter, that will tell us who the current player is as they make their moves. We'll do a span with current player, that way we can, uh, quickly identify, and it's always going to start with X, so let's go ahead and type it out that way. That way the current player is always displayed on the screen, so you know if you're playing with a buddy of yours, or who's really, who's actually going to do that? So if you're actually sitting there and playing against yourself, you're just learning, learning new things along the way, this span will make an easy way for us to target something with an ID selector and change its inner text content with jQuery when we get to that step. Uh, inside of the game info panel and below the current player info, we're going to have a div ID game result that will say like X wins or draw or O wins or something like that. Uh, do I need to get this? I mean, game result should be enough. I don't think I need another result, like another class on it because it'll be, this will be specific for displaying who the winner is. 
And I don't think I need additional classes that's going to be shared on there. So I think game results should be just fine for that right there and for semantics. Okay, whatever. And then beneath that, I'm going to have our, because uh, again, the way I'm going to do this will be kind of cool for those of you that don't have experience in grid. I'll show you all a cool way you can control the placement of elements with grid that will not match up to what your HTML is if you want to. So anyway, our scoreboard is going to be beneath that. So basically, it's going to be like current player. Uh, winner draw, w display winner draw. But we're going to hide that in the CSS, and below that will be a scoreboard, and below that will be our reset button. So you know what? While we're here, from our below our reset or our scoreboard, I might as well add the following. Gum, game. Let's try that again. There we go. Remember, class equals button comes from our main CSS file where I have what default buttons should look like. We'll say reset game as the I and as the class right there. So there we go. That's what our current uh, layout looks like. Nothing too fancy, but then again, it'll all look fancier once the CSS comes in place. I'm just kind of building out the skeletons here, the skeleton of it here. So inside of our div, something I haven't used in a while that I wanted to do is our good friend, the table element. I haven't done one of these in a while, so I wanted to throw it in there. So we'll have two columns. Table row, I need a table, oh, that's right, I need THs instead of TRs. As you can see, I was like, this doesn't seem right for how tables work. I was like, I think I'm missing something. So there is a row with two heads. There we go, our two columns right there. Uh, and beneath that, I want another row. And inside of that table row, I need table data cells uh, with times two with a span inside of each. So there we go. Uh, and as you guessed it, that span will be for the number of wins for X and O. So I need to give this some IDs to make it easy to select from our JavaScript and jQuery to change its inner text. So I'm going to go ahead and give them some IDs to make our life easy. That is a beautiful looking table already, y'all, with that terrible red color on it. Again, the button styling came from the main CSS file, which is why it uh, probably appears better. All this should be inside my main container unless I managed to break something, which I don't think I did. Yeah, it's all in the container. Is it all not in the game board because the game info is uh, separate and outside of that info panel? Okay, good. All right, here we go. We got our content being built up now. Let's actually go style this sucker out a little bit because we got some serious styling to do. Let's start with our game board. That way we can focus on that first and foremost. I'm just collapsing some stuff here to make it easier to read when we toggle back and forth. So our game board and our three rows in particular. Remember, the rows are the current or the direct child of the game board. So if I want the rows to be oriented in a certain fashion, I could use flex, for example, to control where they go. I apply the flex rules to the parent container, which in this case is the game board. So we're gonna delete that and switch to game board as our selector. I'll say display flex. Uh, I want them going in a column fashion to so make sure that, that they go downwards instead of next to each other, which is what flex would do. But then I also wanna do some horizontal centering because the rules are now flipped because I switched from flex direction row to column. Uh, and then we'll add some padding on the inside of this thing and some margin on the outside vertical and then just uh, an automatic amount on the left and right hand sides. So as you can see, uh, the things now went to the center of the screen, which is nice, but we actually need to, well, it'd be nice to see what the cells actually look like. So we'll do row in a second because we still have class row to worry about from our HTML. But don't forget inside of each row is a cell. So we're gonna go to our style sheet and do the following. We're gonna make the cells actually look like cells. I'm gonna go for a more old school, like Windows 98 style tic-tac-toe game board instead of like the typical pound sign or octothorpe or hatch or cross hatch or I don't know what these crazy, I don't know what you crazy kids call it. I still think of it as a pound sign, right? The tic-tac-toe grid. So instead of doing that, let's just make each one like a box that we can like mouse over and click on, for example, rather than the traditional like tic-tac-toe Two, four lines to make it go across because again, I want to make this different from the, how we teach it in our course So you can actually learn something new along the way in case you're an alumni of our course And you wanted some more experience with this. Let's make them 100 by 100 size that way. They are Large with the current zoom that we have on this here, right? Yeah 
Uh, because now, why does it look that way? I'll, we'll, we'll see why the X and the O, because remember, this X is the top left, and this is the center square. We'll see in a moment why they're all ordered this way. When I add some borders to it, and we'll make them like two pixels thick, solid, and we'll make them the primary color variable from our uh, main CSS file. And there, as you can see, why everything looks so spaced out. Now remember, I wanted each row to be in a column, but the because those flex rules to the game board only apply to each row and not the cells inside of the row. So if I want the cells inside of a row to appear next to each other, we can either do floats or we can just say display flex, which will make them whoop, go in that fashion right there. So remember, divs are by default block level elements. They did not want to share space with one another and the display flex rule uh, breaks that. It just says, hey, uh, have these divs be next to each other horizontally and that's all that flex did for us here and we're not going to apply a flex column because that'd make it go back to behaving the way it was before so there you go that's how we quickly fix that tic-tac-toe cell grid problem right there with our simple rule of display flex i wanted to visualize it for y'all which is why i chose to add display flex to the row a little bit later rather than first off and just tell me and just say trust me bro so from there uh, I need to make sure I have cursor pointer on these things so we can indicate to our users that they are going to be indeed clickable. I want user select none on here. I know it's not entirely browser friendly, but if I click and drag, I don't want the text inside of the cells to highlight, which is what user select none will do. Let's go ahead and change their background color to like a just simple white color. And we're going to give them a border radius of five pixels. I'm going to move that closer to the border property just to make my thing kind of organized here. So there we go. Looking better. Let's make the font size a bit bigger as well. So I'll do like font size and color down here. So font size will be like half the size of the, of the uh, cells themselves. So 50 pixels. Uh, we can do a text align center and a line height of 100 pixels, I think, or 50 pixels. So we can center the text vertically as well. But we could also just as easily say, hey, Justify content center align item center is a real and display flex is a easy combination to Horizontally and vertically center anything remember the vertical centering of align items depends on the height of the div Which we have hard-coded to be a hundred pixels So it knows how to vertically center something should it have the space to do so remember that's how that works right there And then finally we're gonna make sure each one has a little bit of padding on the inside. Maybe Do we need padding and I mean no, with the text being centered, I don't, really, I don't think we need padding now that I think about it. But we will add some margin between these things here, just so they are a little bit spaced out. Again, I want to make this look like a non-traditional tic-tac-toe grid, but you can see where the lines would go if we didn't have them. So from here, let's go ahead and give the cells a pseudo selector of hover. So when the mouse hovers over it, they're going to change their background color to be uh, the variable evaluated from primary light that way when we mouse over them whoop, we get a very clear indication to our users that it is a thing they can click on to play this game aha all right so moving on down to the stuff down here it gets kind of fun because i'm gonna do something kind of cool right i was like we could do this how i know how to do it or i'm gonna learn something new along the way so we're gonna go ahead and select our current player info that is the div that wraps the current player right there I'm gonna give it a slightly bigger font size to make it like more, a, is it current player info? Let's see, game info, current player info is the class, not an ID. I did that right, didn't I? Maybe that font size just isn't as big as I thought it was. What if I do font weight bold? That's clearly, that had clearly worked. I think it's because I'm so zoomed out, yeah. Uh, because normally when I'm super zoomed in, all the fonts have like, well, obviously if I if I change the font size and I'm very zoomed in, it'll have a much more pronounced effect, which is maybe what my brain is telling me I'm looking for here. We can always adjust that later, whatever, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter all that much. So from there, let's actually make our scoreboard look a bit nicer as a table. So I can say score board table as our selector this says find the table element inside the scoreboard this will make it so again i could have added an id to the table i could just do an element selector for tables because if i'm pretty sure there's gonna be no other tables on this page doing a table level element selector would be fine if i have one table but that would scale terribly in case i do add another one so i'll do this right here where i'll say hey inside the scoreboard element find the table element uh table 
scoreboard class element selector, find the table elements and style them. I'll make sure that they are 100% of their parents width. And we're gonna do a border collapse. Selects a table's border model. And we're gonna give it a collapse, which ensures that we're gonna have single line borders when I build this sucker out. From there, we need to adjust, you guessed it, scoreboard. And for now, I'll do scoreboard TH and TDs in the same selector. So this will tell us to select scoreboard table heads and scoreboard table table data cells, AKA the TDs. I'm gonna give these suckers a one pixel solid var primary color border from our right there. We're gonna text align center these suckers, give them some padding. So they are a little spaced out right there. And you know what, we're gonna adjust their background color to be, well, I guess I could do, we could do something. For now, I'll just do background color, which should be the background color of the page. So that won't make too much of a difference. There we go. You could Now you could adjust the color of the table if you want to. Uh, I mean, it, it defaults to that. So I could make a different color. You know what? No, that's fine. I don't care that much. We'll, we'll leave it there. You can you can change this to something goofy if you want. I don't care. Just pointing out that, remember, you can use those root colors to give yourself some, some theming across this thing, right? So from there, we need to make our... Uh, maybe our game result right here be a bit more nice looking. Then from there, all I need to do is put this in a grid to make it all look a bit nicer. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So we're gonna say our game result div, uh, div ID game result X wins. We're gonna make that be a bit more nice looking. So something interesting I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give it a set height of say 30 pixels. You can adjust this because I'm gonna make it I need it to stay there in the flow of my HTML, but I wanna keep it hidden. And there's a way to do that because display none removes it from the flow. Let me show you what I mean. If I switch to display none as our choice of doing this, <laughs> display none, look what happened. The table collapsed upwards because it is not considered in the flow. It is not considered in the flow of the HTML when it is not displayed none. And that's not really what I really wanna do. What I wanna do is do a visibility hidden. If I can learn to type. Visibility hidden, as you can see, the table did not squeeze up underneath current player because it is hidden, not displayed. This is actually a fantastic, what I would define as a shit test of a question that you might get in interviews again. There are some people that put a lot of really weird value on people memorizing the fundamentals. I think there are some things that are important to memorize, and I think there's plenty of things that if I can get an answer with one Google search, why am I gonna bother memorizing it? Uh, I'll memorize it if I write this stuff all the time, but otherwise, I can just Google it and probably be able to infer and tell you what that default value or behavior is. Like, if you get the classic shit test of, uh, which, which one of these will remove it from the HTML workflow, and they expect you to like, know this and ding you like, or take points away from you or not give you a job because you didn't just memorize this or you haven't worked with it a whole lot, but nevertheless, you could figure it out with a single Google search of dis display or visibility removed from the general uh, layout during rendering in the DOM. I mean, come on, man. Like, I hate that kind of crap, but nevertheless, remember visibility can keep it in the workflow of elements, display removes it from the workflow of elements. So that's the big thing y'all wanna remember. So for now, we're gonna keep it visible so I can actually look at what I'm adjusting. Uh, this time we'll use line height. If I make the line height the same size as its div, that gives me the ability to uh, vertically align this stuff. Let's go ahead and make the font size almost as big as the size of the text. We're gonna also gonna make it a font weight of bold to make it stand out a bit more when it actually appears. Uh, oh, does it really need a, I mean, let's not give it, I give everything a border and border radius, so screw that, we're not gonna do that there. We'll do a display flex, justify content center, align item center, and visibility, I guess, hidden. So I mean, like, yeah, that looks decent to me. We could give it some padding or margin to offset it away from the table and the current player, but for now, whatever. 
Uh, I'm going to leave that visibility hidden toggled off for now because we're almost done doing what I want to do. So watch this. There's some cool stuff we could do with Grid that I actually learned about not too long ago. So I'm shoehorning it in here for a fun little lesson. So I'm going to go ahead and I need to assign Grid Area. So my Grid Area will be the Game Info panel. This div and its immediate children will be what I wish to control. So we're going to have the game result div ID. We're going to have the scoreboard class. We're going to have the reset game button as an ID. And we're going to have current player info as well. So I could go back up to current player info up here to add this, but I'm going to write a separate selector down here just to keep it organized. Yeah, organizing it in a different way just so y'all can visualize it down here. So what am I trying to get at? Current player info. I'm going to call this grid-area. So this allows me to determine an item's size and location with the grid by contributing a line span or nothing to its grid placement. So there's some cool things we could do here. So I'm going to say grid area. I'm going to give it a name called current player. I could call this pizza for all that it really matters. Then again, we had what? The scoreboard as another thing. Grid area. Scoreboard. Game dash result, grid area, result. Let's call it something else. Let's call it result banner. So I can point out that the name does not need to be tied to what you see in the HTML. Again, we could call it pizza or car or whatever. It doesn't matter. Grid area, reset button. Again, we'll change up the names a little bit to point out these are just kind of like variable names or placeholder names that you are making up or like giving them labels you could use later. And that later is right up here in game info. So we're going to say display grid and try something new. So right away that has messed everything up as you can already see because the, the button has just thwomped or chomped on everything. So what we're going to do now is say grid template areas, right? Specify name grid areas, which are not associated with any particular grid item, but can be referenced in the grid placement properties. So now that I have grid areas written out for these selectors, I can now reference them as string values up here in like almost like variables in my grid template areas. It needs to end in that, in that semicolon. So we're going to add uh, that right there. So we now we have my string values that will correspond to these four elements. Current player info score or rather current player scoreboard, result banner, result button, the names I gave them. So if I wanted my reset button first, I would do the following. Reset button, then I would do current player, then I would do result-banner. So in these string values go what you called uh, the grid areas themselves. This is how you control them, right? So scoreboard inside of that and check it out. I now have it written in a way that all this stuff appears this way. Check that out. See that? Or I could say move the reset button down right above the scoreboard, but uh, below the X wins. Or I can say by switching the semicolon placement, move it to the bottom below the scoreboard. Below that will be the result banner. Below that is our current player, which is not centered. Why is it not centered? Uh, what do we forget on it? Is it current player that I messed up? Yeah, current player. Mm, I mean, I guess I just need to give it a text align center. Because I did, 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 did I forget something somewhere? Because I, I mean, I could do it from the grid itself. I'm pretty sure. Let's see if the grid, the grid part works. So because I have display grid, I do have access to a couple of things such as vertical alignment and horizontal alignment of the grid areas. There we go. That gives me the squish I was looking for. Everything was like the width of the thing. So current player still not center, which I guess I just means I have to go up yonder and do a text align center on it or something like that. Text align center, which maybe I didn't have somewhere. There we go. All right, so that's what we're looking like so far. Uh, not too bad. If I want some spacing around these elements, which I don't think this looks too terrible as is, but I can, for example, Give it something with grid called gap, where I can say add a gap of 20 pixels between the things here, which is kind of big, but that's fine. You could also go down to like a gap of like 10 pixels, for example. So it has some spacing around these elements. As you can see, the button is just as propped away from the scoreboard. There's now a gap between the grid areas that we have going on. The reason the current player one is so big is because it's a paragraph 
inside of a div and that paragraph has some defaults looks like margin around it right there and both uh, in both the vertical and the bottom right there so you could always switch that from a paragraph to just a regular div or something else i'm kind of fine with the the current player being offset a little bit away from the win or draw banner etc cetera, etc cetera. now that looks pretty good let's go ahead and toggle that visibility hidden back on it's gone but again the scoreboard doesn't shift into place with our visibility uh, not removing it from the rendering workflow. So there we go. That is the game right there. I'm fine. I'm fine with the way it looks. I don't really care to make it look any fancier or worse or better, whatever you want to call it. But now we can actually go code out our game. And again, this will be fairly quick here with a small explanation here or there of how it's going to work. So just like we did in the memory match game, I do not want to pollute the entirety of my global scope with a bunch of variables and stuff like that if I'm not careful. And I'm also not choosing to do OOP style code, which means I need to do the following. Just like in memory match, I'm gonna do an IIFE that will be immediately invoked that will have some code found within it. And then outside of that, as always, I will, even though I don't need this, because remember the uh, JavaScript is written at the bottom of the document body, but I will still say, hey document, when your DOM content is loaded, run the following code, just to keep things, again, isolated away from the global scope where I can. Tic-tac-toe game will eventually have a function called start. And while we're here, I might as well select that reset game button. I will say, hey, jQuery, find the reset game button. That's what I called it, right? I've written it like five times now. You think I remember reset dash game. Okay, reset game, uh, bind a click listener to that, that will then run the same thing, tic-tac-toe game dot start. And I haven't added the start, as you can see, anywhere to tic-tac-toe game. Uh, let's go ahead and just say this will eventually return something called start that will do something, you know? So for now, this returns value five. I don't, I don't care what it does. Or 42, the answer to life universe and everything. There we go. Doesn't matter. I know start, uh, it's not a function, for God's sake. <laughs> I can't write bad code. There we go. All right. That means nothing. It means nothing. This is just going to be our public API when we get there. Again, what can be referenced outside of tic-tac-toe game inside when we met, where we reference that variable that we created for this particular game. So here we go. Uh, again, this will be a bit faster than memory match for those of you that have tic-tac-toe experience. I'm going to move a little bit quicker because the f more fun part will be the future videos. So I am going to choose to do the following unlike what we do in our course where I tell you to select the DOM and use the HTML collection of your cells and their index positions to correspond with the game, I need to track the state of the game as it exists. And I'm gonna track the state of the game from JavaScript by having an array of arrays. And as you can see, the, array, the inner arrays correspond to the rows and the inner positions respond to the columns because that matches up the way I coded my data attributes from the game board row cells, right? The data attributes correspond to rows and columns in the same way that index positions for the outer array correspond to rows and for each inner array correspond to the columns. This will also allow me to track the state of the game board from within code and do some unique things rather than just reading what's currently in the DOM, which is how we solved it in our course, in our front in our full end in our full stack program or our front end fundamentals course which you have interest in check out the description down below for a link to our community membership to learn all that stuff if you're coming here and you're like how do i learn those basics that's where you learn those fundamentals uh we're gonna do it different here so this is how i'm gonna choose to do it i need to know who the current player is we're gonna start with x as always and i want to track how many wins we got maybe through this right here i'll choose to do a an object called wins, wins.x, and wins.o to know what the current player winning and losing is. And we're gonna make it correspond with capital letters so we can actually use the key current player to find something within that object if we wanted to. Meaning we could write wins current player, and because our current player is a string value with capital X or capital O, which matches these keys down here, that's a quick and dirty and cool way to find that particular person's wins, which I think is nifty. All right. So that's the variables we need to play the game. Uh, just like I did in 
initialize game. Just like I did inside of memory match, we're gonna use a function called initialize game that's gonna start everything and act as our reset as well, which means that's what is going to be running down here. So we're gonna say start will run initialize game when it's called. Now, I chose very specifically to do let on the board for the same reason I chose to do it in the memory card game, because I wanna make sure I can just reassign a fresh value of the board. You might be wondering, Luke, what is the purpose of initializing the board with this value when the first thing you do is do that in initialize game anyway, or for game resets? Like, why don't you just do null here, and when you call initialize game, it'll give it the first value. There are pros and cons to both ways of doing this. It's a matter of style or preference dictated by your team or yourself. This tells me that board is completely unnecessary and not uh, needed to be referenced until it is given a value, but I don't have it yet at the time of the game starts. This tells me what its structure is going to be now or later and usable if I, in case I need to do something to the board before initialize game runs, I now have the ability to do so where I didn't when it was null. So, and this also tells me its value is important to the functionality of the game and not just assigned at a later time. I mean, again, this could be read either way, whether it's null saying it's not important until it's initialized, also don't reference it until it's initialized somewhere, uh, or assigned a value rather. Uh, and, and if it's written this way, it tells me it can be used before it is actually initialized in our function down yonder. And it tells me what its structure is going to be and it's integral to how the game is gonna work. So again, this is a style preference thing, pro con, no right answer. Uh, but if anyone thought, hey, Luke, why not just start with null that way? You don't, have, that's repetitive code down here. Totally valid question, totally valid, valid way of thinking right there. So first thing, current player equals X. So that way, again, initialize game is what's gonna run when we restart the game. Remember, we click on reset game, it runs start. So we're gonna make our initialize game act as both resetting the game and starting the game. We need to make sure that, again, this is great with jQuery. Hey, jQuery. Find all elements with class cell and empty out their inner texts. So as we can see, all those X's and O's that we had hard coded into our HTML automatically disappear right away. This will be perfect for reset as well. I'm gonna go remove them from our HTML right there. And I'm gonna leave that X wins game result because it doesn't matter because we have it hidden anyway, right? It's hidden. But on game resets, it'll currently be visible. So I will say, hey jQuery, find that game result div and toggle its visibility. Now, if, if I'm not mistaken, there is no, there is no like dot visibility function in jQuery. So we're gonna say go to its CSS and adjust visibility to hidden in case it isn't already. So again, we have that defaulted in our style sheet, but this is also gonna be acting as reset game, which means hide the visibility property of that div when we click reset game, because it'll say draw or O wins. We click reset game, it should toggle invisible again. Uh, and from there, we're going to add our click listener. So we're gonna say function add cell click handler. And we're gonna invoke that up here as well. We're gonna say add the cell click handler when we initialize or restart the game. So what we're gonna do in here is say, hey, when we click on anything of class cell, I wanna add an on click binder to it that will run the following function. What I want it to do is to grab which position it is, AKA which column or rather which row X and which column Y it is. And we're gonna pass it into a function. So really quick, I'll have function make move. It needs to know the X, Y and what specific cell it has been clicked on. So we're gonna call make move down yonder with an X, Y and a cell. And the cell is represented by the jQuery value of this. That represents which cell we have clicked on. How do we get which X and Y they are? I'm gonna do it this way. I'll say, hey, jQuery, find the thing we have clicked on, the target of the event, the jQuery parentheses, this. Look for a data attribute called X. And then on this one, you guessed it, look for a data attribute called Y. Let me go ahead and console log uh, X, Y, and cell to confirm that it gives me what I want for adding that cell. Click handle. Remember, this is just about binding what cell we're clicking on and we'll pass in those values to a function called make move that'll actually be the logic of the game to keep things separate. This one is more about DOM events. This one's about actually game logic. But let's make sure it's doing what I think it's doing. 
Yeah, so as I move around and click, it tells me which cell we're clicking on. That's, you know, C the cell function in it is the jQuery version selected version of that cell. So that's why we're looking at right there rather than a traditional HTML element. You might see console log with vanilla DOM. That is what the console logged jQuery element looks like. And yeah, it knows the coordinate plane of row and column of which ones I'm clicking on. So it's working the way we expect. That's what I like to see. So from there, uh, we need to make sure that a player cannot Oh, let's start playing the game before I talk about this. So we're going to say the following. I want the cell that we clicked on, represented by that parameter cell, to alter its inner text to be whoever the current player is. This is all I need to get the game to draw out the current player. But as you can imagine, that's not very fun, so we also need to toggle our current player, right? We need to not only toggle, but we also need to uh, per like uh, alter who our current player is. Is because remember it starts with uh, current player X, but it needs to go whoever our O toggle ends up being. So I need to reassign current player. So I'll say current player is now equal to O. But that just means it'll now be O on every subsequent click. So X and then a bunch of O's. Right? We need to toggle back and forth. We can do that with a operator called the ternary operator, which is done this way. It's basically like a a fancy if else, but not really. So we're going to say take the current value of current player and compare it. If it's an X, then return the string value O, otherwise return the string value X. Now, this is not just a simple logical condition like an if else statement. Uh, this returns something. So this is your condition. This is your condition. This is what to do if true. Otherwise, this is what to do when false. Now remember, this returns it and it returns it and stores it into a variable, which is what a great use of a ternary is. It is not just a shorthand for an if else statement. They have an additional step in that they return a value somewhere, which is why you see them used in this way. So that's what that's gonna do for us. We're gonna go ahead and also say, hey, find the current player span right here and toggle or change its text value to reflect our current player as well. So there we go. Now it has the toggling of the X and the O and the current player toggle down here is working as expected, but we have a problem. I can cheat. Maybe you wanna leave this in as a feature for your game. That's fine. <laughs> I have no problem with that if you wanna uh, rock it that way. But what's more important is that how do we prevent someone from cheating? There's a couple different ways to do it, but remember what we haven't done yet. All we've done right now is We've changed one JavaScript variable, the current player, and the DOM reflects the move, changes the current player, and reflects the next player, or the new current player, with a DOM manipulation right here. What we haven't done is we haven't actually manipulated the actual board of the game yet. So what I need to do is head down to the function make move, and before I do anything, I need to make sure that my board is updated with who just made a move. Because remember, initially my board is a bunch of empty strings inside of arrays inside of an array. So how do we know what row and column that we are adjusting? Well, that's what the X and Y are for. There you go. Let's console log the board after we uh, draw that value into the array subarray. Uh, and let's console log the board each time we click. So this will be the top leftmost cell of the game. So there are our array of three subarrays, and as you can see, the top left is an X. So the bottom right will now be an O. And wouldn't you know it, the game is now the game state is now updating inside of code, and it's staying in sync with the DOM. So rather than reading the DOM and inferring what the game state currently is, we're controlling it completely from JavaScript, which is a more advanced solution than I know uh, a lot of us did back at that tic-tac-toe lab in the very beginning part of our course that uh, broke some people in a, in a nice way, right? That's something. That's a kind of goofy way to think about it. But like I said, it, it sets us up for some cool things we're going to do in future videos, which is why I want to do it this way. But now that I have that, I have something interesting that I can do. I'm going to take all this code and cut it and put it in an if statement because I'm going to do the following. Board X, board Y... If it's equal to an empty string, then they are allowed to play the game as is, which means I have now developed my own anti-cheat. So I can no longer overwrite somebody's square 
because I check the current state of the board at the position we've clicked on. And I only allow the game to play if it's an empty string. If it has an X or O inside of that place, none of this code runs because there is no else condition for this code. So there you go. Next, we need to somehow determine if the game is won, if it's a draw, or if it's just the regular game logic. The regular game logic is toggle the player and adjust the current player tracker. That's all it is. So we're gonna do one of these. We're gonna say if, else if, else. And the else is the general logic of the game when it's just playing as it needs to play, right? Let's make sure that works. I'm just gonna put in some blank false statements inside here to make sure nothing's broken. Still works. Okay, now we need to have a way to check draws and to check wins. Check draw is actually really easy, so I'm gonna do that one first. I'm gonna write a function. I'm gonna write, sorry, it's outside the scope of that. I'm gonna write a function called check draw. And there's actually a really interesting way we're gonna do this. It's a draw if uh, our board doesn't have a win. So if check win. If our check win function, which will be up here, if it doesn't report a win has happened, and if our check draw says, hey, there is no empty string inside of our array, then that means it's a draw. And that's what this does right here. And that's all it is. That's why I want to do it first because it's really easy to do so. So if check draw returns true, it will then fire this off. So what we're going to do is ask the cell to unbind its click listener so the game is over. It's a draw, so we shouldn't be able to click on cells anymore and continue causing check draws and check wins over and over and over again. And I also need to get the game result banner, adjust its visibility CSS to be visible, not true, it's visible, and change the inner text to say it's a draw. And there you go. That is the simplest way I can think of to do a check draw. Let's console log what a board.flat looks like and the includes I'll talk about here in just a moment. So I'm gonna console log check draw as we go along. So at the moment, our board is an array of arrays of a bunch of empty strings. But notice what happens when I click flat. It took or included the dot flat method on JavaScript arrays. It took the array of subarrays and it converted it or rather flattened it into a singular array of all the inner elements, which are all empty strings. So as you can see, if I say, hey, if it includes empty spaces, it cannot be a draw, dot includes, empty string, dot includes, determines whether an array includes a certain element returning true or false as appropriate. So if it includes an empty string, it cannot be a draw. Still has empty strings, still has empty strings. And then finally, this cannot be a draw because it still has one empty string, but if I hit this, it says, oh, there are no empty strings in this flattened array, and that's true or false. The opposite of that is true, which means the only solution left is it's a draw. And as you can see, draw appeared right down there if you weren't paying attention. It recognized we got a draw. But remember, uh, there is a valid way, there is a valid move or part of the game that says, hey, the last click of the game might be the win and not a draw, which is why we have to include the check win first. Because remember, the else if will go after the if statement before it has false first. So we have to make sure that our check win function fires correctly on the final move before it goes down to check to see if somebody drew the game or not. Then, you know, while we're here, I might as well go ahead and take game result and paste it into our, why don't, Oh, because that draws the else if. <laughs> Our game result visibility visible inside of here, and I'll say the text will be whoever the current player, uh, whoever the current player is should win. So we'll take this into like a template literal and say interpolate our current player wins exclamation point. I need to adjust my wins as well, right? So I need to adjust my wins. So I can say if somebody won, I need to take their wins current player and add one to it, plus equals one. And same thing, I'm gonna turn off my cell click in the event that they won right there. So there we go. Now technically I could do this organized a little bit differently because you're saying loot is some repetitive code right here you could optimize. I know, I know, forget about it though. It doesn't matter all that much. All right, so we got that rocking on. I also need to adjust my scoreboard. So. Uh, my scoreboard is done with the following. Remember, my scoreboard has two inner 
TDs that have spans, I believe. Yeah. Uh, ID X wins, ID O wins, right? So we can say, uh, yeah, we could do it this way. I can say, hey, jQuery, find the element of either X dash wins or O dash wins, but instead of X or O written manually, take current player, which I made into a capital letter because I'm an idiot, and we'll do two lowercase. So basically, take the current player variable, which is a capital X or capital O, lowercase it, and then uh, interpolate dash hyphen wins because that will correspond to this ID right here. So basically I'm making a dynamic jQuery selector, which again blows a lot of my students' minds away. They're like, oh, you could do that? This is like in our uh, jQuery game of the just my type typing game where you have to do like the ID and the uh, event key code, for example, like an old school type thing. Uh, that's a quick, that's a, that's basically what we're doing here. We're making a dynamic selector that selects one span or the other based on who the current player is. And from there, all we need to do is adjust its inner text to reflect what I adjusted on line 40, which is what is the value of wins at current player. So this makes sure it increments by one. This will display, so let's say O wins. This will increment O wins by one, say O wins in the DOM, and also reflect the scoreboard column and that tab table data. So let's say that that winner's value goes and needs to be displayed to what the uh, new value is here. So that's all that does right there. So it's already an hour, Luke. My God, man. Uh, that's it, though. We're almost done. We have check win to write, and that's all we have left to do. So function check win. We'll replace up here the false condition we wrote in manually, and I'll say it's going to check for a win. How's it going to check for a win, you say? Good question. What it's going to do is the following. It will return false if everything beforehand fails. Okay? What's going to happen beforehand? It's going to run a for loop. Inside of that for loop, it's going to have two possible things it can do. Yeah, so here's how it's going to go. We have the following. We need to check diagonals, check rows and columns. Now, the diagonals are hard-coded because there's not a clever way to do that from inside of for loop. There's actually a different way we could do the solution, but again, I'm doing it in a kind of weird, different way than I would expect any newbie in our actual course that has tic-tac-toe as a lab and they find this video first will be very evident that they found this video and follow along with me rather than actually trying it out themselves. So, uh, like I was saying, what we need to do is to check diagonals is fairly straightforward. We have two diagonals total, top left, if that has our current player inside of it, and as you guessed it, this will be with a lot of repetition, and board in the center, which is 1-1, one, one, should be our center value, current player, and and if board 2-2 two, two is our current player, so that's 0-0, zero, zero. so that's 0-0, zero, zero. One one two two. So it is the backslash diagonal is that set of code right there. Now, if all of that, or so what I'm going to do is copy and paste it here. I'm also going to oh, oh, nope, go back. Not only going to copy and paste it, I'm going to copy it and wrap it in a set of parentheses because we're going to have to do an entirely other check, right? An entirely other check. Did I do something wrong on the logic here? Because Prettier is giving me an error, so well, you can't see it. Prettier behind me here has an error. See that red prettier? So I think I'm missing a piece of syntax somewhere because I'm a doofus. But why is the question? Well, it says, on, oh, because this is a syntax error. Hold on. Okay. It was the, okay, my bad. That's why I had a syntax error because I had pseudo code written up here that wasn't commented out. So if that was the backslash, now we got to do the forward slash, which is done via zero, two, one, one is still the center. And this down here will be two, zero. So just like before, we have our tic-tac-toe grid. We had the backslash. Now we need the forward slash. So uh, row zero, column two, row one, column one, row two, column zero, that is our forward slash diagonal right there. So there is our hard-coded check on the diagonals. 
if that happens to be a case, we return true. That checks our diagonals. To check the uh, rows and columns, it is easy. We're gonna do a let i equal zero style loop. i is less than and up to three, not including three, i plus plus. Remember, it goes zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two is what it's gonna do here. So, same thing. We're gonna do two conditions, one for the column or one for the row, or one for the row and one for the column, right? So in both of these, I will have something very similar. That is the uh, row we are now checking. So we're gonna say, if that is our current player, and you guess, I'm just gonna copy and paste this. So paste, paste, and remove the, the dangling ands. Uh, if row zero, zero, Okay, well, you have to think about here. Hold on, I'm just going to copy and paste the set of parentheses into that other set of parentheses and adjust it, and then we'll talk about how it works and what it does. Return true because somebody is one. In this case, we're going to code in 0, 1, 2 for the rows hard-coded and then do I for the columns. So like I said, this checks our rows and columns. Let me draw out my grid, and this should finish it out. So what we have going on is on the initial run, i is zero. So it checks zero, zero. Is there an x there? Sure. Then it checks zero, one, which would be here. Then it checks zero, two to see if there's an x there. Then it checks the columns, right? Let's say that was false because someone had a zero or an o there. So that's going to say zero, zero for column, one, zero for column, and then two, zero for column. Okay, that's the, how the checks work there, right? So you can, y'all kind of, oh, dang it. So y'all can see how the thing's kind of thrown along now. Let's say none of that reported anything, and now we're gonna go to i of one. So i goes to one. Let's go down here. One zero would be here. Uh, one one would be here. One two would be here. Then let's say that didn't return true. So then it goes to zero one, which would be here. One, zero, one, one, which would be here, and then two, one, which would be here. So as you can see, it just checks that. Then it will check this. And then finally, it will check over here. So that's a terrible drawing, but hopefully it makes sense with the way I drew it out, how I did the check right there. So that's how our loop will go through this thing and check for a win or a loss, which means we should theoretically be done unless I'm missing something. So there is all our X's, X wins, reset game. It works just fine. Let's do O in the column or a diagonal. The diagonal wins. Let's do X in the other diagonal. X wins. Let's do O in the far right-hand column. It wins. And yeah, we got it. Let's do a draw. And we got a draw. So yeah, the game is done. We removed that final console log and in an hour and six minutes, I think that's enough for this video. Uh, in the next video, we're gonna add some other goofy looking features. Uh, I think what we're gonna do is have maybe some kind of button system. Or here's what I'm thinking about what we can do. Maybe some kind of button group or like links over here to change the state of the game. I don't know how I wanna code it out for style yet. Maybe over here. Or heck, maybe even like links down here to make sure that you know the game can be played as is and the, and the entire changing of the game will be button group down there. And what I mean by button group is like, imagine, imagine we'll have like, you know, a button group where you'll have almost like a toggle type thing where we have like game mode one versus game mode two versus game mode three and it'll highlight which one it's on and we're gonna have that like drawn up here or something like that what is the hot key for i okay because i'm hitting some kind of hot key to thicken up these lines and it's pissing me off because i always forget how to adjust it on the camera i have to like pause the video and go look at it but either way the point being, I'm going to add that button group there, and what we're going to do is we're going to have different game modes. This is going to be called the classic game mode. We're going to have computer or AI game mode, where we're going to start learning some really, really rudimentary AI. We're not going to be using, like, chat GPT or anything like that. What we're going to do instead is we're just going to have a computer look for an available space and play a move there. That's it.
That's as simple as it needs to be for computer AI. From there, we could also make the algorithm or the decision-making process of where the computer will place its move. If it's an O, for example, we can make it prioritize anything that's about to win rather than just purely random. And then from there, we're gonna add a maybe uh, advanced game mode that will go back to two player, but maybe each player will have a set of cooldowns they can burn. They have one that will do time travel backwards, and then maybe one that will give them like an eraser tool to cheat. That way they like both players will have a cooldown to go back one move, and both players will have an overwrite one move cooldown, right? That they can burn one time per game, so it kind of makes the game more spicy. So we have some cool things we could do where they can right over a move, which we saw earlier. That's a that we made that anti-cheat for it, but we're gonna make it so they can do it at one time only. And then a reverse that says, go back to the previous state of the board uh, for a reverse, because you realize you goofed or something like that. So we'll have a couple different game modes to take an otherwise simple game and to punch it up a little bit for this video series before we move on to whatever the next game and the game project will be. So yeah, uh, that's it for this video. Remember to do the YouTube stuff, to like, comment, subscribe, because it really does help us. I love making these tutorials. I love seeing people come here and have aha moments or just chat in the comments or join our community and chat in Discord. Um, I, I, I love the interaction and teaching people. I get an immense satisfaction from this. So I would appreciate it if you guys did all that YouTube stuff uh, to make sure we can keep growing and I can keep you know doing this for y'all. So do all that stuff. Check the description, descrip description? description down below for relevant links to the repository, the extension, jQuery, cheat sheet, and things like that. And I'll see you on the next video where we begin adding some goofy features to this fun little game.